Welcome to The Bridge Online. No matter where you're worshiping from, we are so glad to have you with us. This week, Pastor Doug has another message for us. So grab your Bibles and let's dive in. All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Romans chapter 12. We're going to start a new series entitled Transformed. Transformed. And so this morning, if you have notes, if you have something to take notes, even if you just have your phone, you've got a note app or something on there, take notes this morning. We're going to, we're going to teach we're going to learn. I really, I, I, the only way I can explain this series is I felt like a couple of weeks ago, God just began to minister in my spirit to teach on Romans chapter 12. That's, and so that's what we're going to do. And, and instead of trying to jam an entire chapter in one, in one sermon, we're going to take a couple of weeks and we're going to go slow, we're going to go methodical, and, and we're going to grow. It's been said that the book of Romans is one of the richest books in all of the Bible. Uh, if you've ever studied the book of Romans, you would you'd probably agree. Roman, all of the Bible is rich, right? All of the Bible is the word of God. But amongst the, the word of God, Romans kind of stands out in a special and unique way. And within the book of Romans is Romans chapter 8, which may be by some scholarly thought that Romans is, Romans chapter 8 is maybe one of the greatest chapters in all of Scripture. Well, if, if that's the case, and it may be, I would say to you that Romans 12 is, is right there in second place. It is, it is without question um, foundational in, in, in Christian living, Romans chapter 12. It, it, it is a central theme to Scripture. Let me say it that way. It is a central theme. And so you should know Romans chapter 12. You should study Romans chapter 12. And, and if you haven't, that's exactly what we're going to do here this morning. Romans chapter 12. This morning we're just going to take two verses, dissect it, break it down. There's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of word meanings. I don't normally do that, but I just feel it's important. All right. Is everybody with me? How many is ready to say, I just want to dive into the word of God. All right. I just want to hear God's word because that is what changes us. That's what, that's what strengthens us is God's word. Not preaching, not, not a man's concept of the word of God, but God's word. And so we're going to read a lot of the scripture as well. Let's, let's do it. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Transformed in the Greek is the same word translated metamorphosis in English. How many of you remember eighth grade biology and the word metamorphosis, right? It's a, it's a term maybe you, you don't use often, but, but maybe this morning you'll begin to remember and think about what it is. The word transformed describes a change from within, so the Apostle Paul is saying to the church, he's, he's getting ready to teach us how there can be change from within. Very important reality. When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, your soul, your spirit man, the, the person that is going to live forever in eternity is what's born again. Your mind is not born again. Your flesh is not born again. And, and how many of you know you're made up of more than just your soul and your spirit? Right? You still have your mind, you still have your flesh to deal with. So, so you can today you can accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and your inner man be go from spiritual death because of sin, right? The wages of sin is death. Your spirit man is dead without a relationship and a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. When you receive him, you're born again. Your spirit man comes to life. But guess what? Your, your mind is still corrupt. Your flesh is still corrupt. And so what Paul is going to teach us is how to begin to transform those areas of your life. And it's important because many Christians, many Christians never, they never go through that process. The, the old saints used the theological term sanctification. M many of you in this room, you've never even heard the term sanctification and what it means to be sanctified. That's the, Romans chapter 12 is beginning to lay out what sanctification looks like. Now, the term metamorphosis, let's describe this really quick. I want to put the, we're going to get that picture as well up there. Uh, metamorphosis is the process of transformation from an immature form to an, to an adult form in distinct stages. It is to become something 
new. And of course, what the, the greatest example, I guess, in nature of metamorphosis would be that of the butterfly, right? And uh, that's probably what you studied. Maybe that's what you dissected when you were in biology class. And really, if you consider this, this evolution or this transformation that takes place from a caterpillar or a moth to a butterfly, it's quite amazing, isn't it? Because, because they're, they seem to be very distinct, different, different, different species, right? Nobody, nobody looks at a moth and thinks, oh, look how pretty. I love the moth. Oh, I, I want to have, have a moth. I want to go to the gardens and see moths. No one does that. But, but, but many of you, you look at a butterfly and you'll tattoo it on your body. Probably not many moth tattoos in the room. And so, and so there's a transformation that takes place from what we would say maybe, maybe not as pleasant to something very, very beautiful and very pleasant. And that is God's plan for each and every one of you. That is the reality. That, this, is, this is God's design. God has designed that not only would your inner man, your spirit man, be born again and come to life, but while you're on earth, you would begin to be uh, transformed, or you would go through a metamorphosis, as it is, going from maybe some ugly stuff, some stuff that wasn't as pleasant or is as pleasant, to something that is made even in the image of Jesus Christ himself. God's plan for you this morning is spiritual growth, spiritual maturity. On, on a side note, really quick before we move on, got into too much study on caterpillars and moths. Anyway, did you know that caterpillars have no way of reproducing. And, and that's why that they, ha they have to go from caterpillar to butterfly in order to produce. I'm, st I'm studying that, I'm thinking, it's exactly the way it is in the spirit realm as well. It's exactly the way it is in Christianity. And today we have a lot of moth Christians who can never reproduce themselves because they're immature, they're still caught up in sin, they're still struggling with their old man, they're still living with carnal thoughts, and they can't reproduce anything spiritually. But when you begin to transform and grow up and mature in Christ and mature in your understanding of his word and mature in his understanding of who you are in him, guess what? Now you're set to reproduce. Now you can begin to have an impact on the individuals around you. Not only that, a caterpillar is stuck in one area. Come on, somebody. A caterpillar can't fly. A caterpillar is stuck to crawling around in a certain region in a certain area. But when that thing becomes a butterfly, now all of a sudden all kinds of doors are open. Some of you have been stuck for so long because you're spiritually immature. You're, you're spiritually immature. You're not allowing God to, to work his transformation in your life from spiritual child, spiritual baby, and that, that's not a negative term, but spiritual baby to spiritual maturity. And because of that, you're missing opportunities that God has for you. You're missing opportunities of ministry and doors that God has open for you in the future, just like a caterpillar. And so this morning, what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks is learn and dive in deep and see what is it that Paul's telling us? How do I grow? How, 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 how can I mature? Is everybody ready? All right, first, first word, really the first word is transformed, but we're not going to count that one. First word is therefore. I want you to notice it in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, I beseech you. By the way, beseech means I strongly encourage, I command Therefore, and, and, and therefore is a bridge word, right? And so really, Romans 12 is a bridge of the entire book. From, from here on, really, to be honest, from 12 on is transformation. How to be transformed, how to mature, how to grow. From, from chapters 1 through 11, Paul is speaking about the great, great plan of salvation. So the therefore means this. This is, this is, in essence, what Paul is saying. In light of the great plan of salvation that I have outlined in chapters 1 through 11, particularly all the benefits that it brings, this is what our response should be. We should offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. And, and so, so some may be struggling this morning because you haven't fully grasped the amazing benefits of what it means to be a follower of Christ. To, to you, it was just, it's just, it's what your grandparents did. It's what, it's what you were, you, you were raised into. I, the, the, the idea of like, uh, I, I'm an American and I'm a Christian. 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm rural country guy, and I'm a Christian man. Like, I understand that, but that's culture. That's, there's, <laughs> you gotta, that, that's culture. Paul doesn't teach, in the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul digs deep and begins to reveal this amazing, glorious plan of God that was, that was formed in the mind and heart of God before the foundation of the world even existed. And, and he, begins to, he begins to expand on it and teach these, the depths and the riches of what it means to be in Christ in this glorious plan that God the Father had in his heart and that Jesus Christ has fulfilled. And he says, in light of that, when you begin to understand the glories and the wonder and the majesties of the salvation plan of God, your proper response should be to present your whole bodies to God. I wonder this morning if there are so few Christians fully committing everything to Christ if it if it doesn't if it's not because there is so little knowledge and understanding of the great plan of salvation the the reality that you were dead you had no hope you and I were lost in our sin with absolutely no hope whatsoever but in the midst of our misery and spiritual death Christ came to the earth shed his blood paid the penalty and the debt of our sin and called us righteous, those who receive him by faith. Washed us of our sins, cleansed us of our unrighteousness and took us from unrighteousness to righteousness. Amen? And when you begin to study and begin to become aware, Paul says, therefore, when you begin to understand, therefore, the response is you will present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Now, the term bodies includes body, mind, and will. You have to understand that it's the totality of who you are. And when you come to the place where you're willing to offer all that you are to God, that is the place that metamorphosis begins. Before we trusted in Christ, we used our bodies for our own pleasure and our own purposes. But now... By faith in Christ, and when we walk in union with Jesus, we now belong to Christ. That's the reality. And we use our bodies for his glory. Keep your finger in Romans 12. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The word of God says it best. Let's read it. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Food for the stomach and stomach for the foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. The Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised both up the Lord and and. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is, is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore... Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's clear teaching, isn't it? It's very obvious that God is saying, I paid a price for you. I expect or I demand a proper response. No one in this room would go purchase something with hard-earned money and then simply allow 
someone else or something just to take, to take part and to misuse it, if you will. And that's nothing but filthy money. From God's perspective, he's saying, I sent my son to bleed and die for you. There was nothing that you did to deserve it or earn it, but I sent my son to die in your place, and he shed his blood on your behalf. And so, so he came, and he purchased you, or the word, that's where we get the word redeemed. That's what redeemed means. He paid a price for your salvation and your spiritual freedom. Paul is saying, you're not your own any longer. Folks, here's, here's a hard reality for American Christians. You're a slave. You're, everyone in this room is subject to slavery. You're, you're a slave to something. You're either, you're either a slave to Jesus Christ, a slave to God, sold to him in faith, or you're a slave to the power of sin. <laughs> not me, I can do what I want. You do what you, you don't do what you want. You do what your flesh tells you to do. That's why, that's why in America, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing obesity skyrocket. We're seeing sexual immorality skyrocket. We're, we're, seeing, we're seeing lack of self-control on levels that, it, that, that societies in human history have not seen. Why? Because the flesh is in control. Let's be real with each other. Why are, we, why are we struggling with weight? Why, why can't we exercise? Why can't we do the things that we, like Paul said, there, I know there's things that I need to do. There, I, I want to read more books. I, I want to gain more knowledge. I, I, I want, the things that I want to do, though, I just can't seem to do them. But those things that I want to stop, I can't stay away from. It's because you're a slave to the power of sin and to the power of the flesh. So you're either a slave to sin and the devil or you are a slave to Jesus Christ. In this particular portion of scripture, Paul is speaking to Christians and he says, you're bought with a price. Your, your bodies are not your own. In short, Paul is teaching that believers have surrendered not only their soul and spirit to God, but also their physical bodies. So, so much so that at the beginning, he says that things, things that are morally indifferent... Or, or that are not specifically forbidden in Scripture. They may be good in and of themselves, but they're, they're morally, they're morally um, amoral. They're just, you don't really know. It's a, what I would call a gray area. Scripture is not clear on them. He's saying, but if they're not good for you, and if they're not good for the people around you, because you have sold yourself to Jesus, you stop doing them just for that reason you got to get that for a minute because that is like, that's a foreign concept in today's society. In other words, most of us live on this plane. If the Bible says don't do it, I know I shouldn't do it. And so I'm going to work hard to make sure I don't do it. Praise God. That's, that's good. But Paul's going a step further and he's saying the true Christian sold to Christ will look at certain areas and say, the scripture is not clear on this subject. It's, it's kind of a gray area. It's, I, I don't know for sure. This person says this, this person says that. I don't know for sure. But you can identify that by partaking in it or doing it, it will either harm you or it will harm the people around you. And because of that, you choose to abstain from it. That's what he, said. That's what he says. That's what it means to sell your body to Christ. That's what it means to present your body as a living sacrifice. That, that's why, and folks, listen, I, I, know, I know what's going on in the church in America. But, but that's why for me, I'm saying to you as a pastor, why would you drink? Ooh, quiet. I know what's going on. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not, it's not up to me to tell you you should drink or shouldn't drink. You should smoke cigarettes or you shouldn't. You don't need me to tell you. Yeah, well, that's not my responsibility. No, 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 no. I've been told that for years. That's not my responsibility. It's not my responsibility to watch what you're doing on Facebook. No, 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 no. The question that I will present to you is have you fully committed your whole life, body, mind, soul, and will to Christ, or have you not? 
And if you answer that question, you'll begin to say, you know what? If my drinking offends someone else and harms someone else who's in a battle, someone else who has struggled, someone else who is addicted, I refuse to be bound by anything, whether it's food or whether it's drink or whether it's entertainment, because I've sold myself fully to Christ. And because of that, I am going to make decisions that not only are honorable to God, but that will bless others. Then you begin to know you're growing up. Somebody say amen and give God praise. You see, when you start making decisions that are not only self-focused and all about self, and you start making decisions that actually benefit others, you're growing up. Isn't that true in, 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 in the regular stages of life? A, a child, a small toddler does not think about anyone else but itself. We expect that. But... but but some of us have to grow up and, and you get to an adult and all of a sudden now you've got to think about others. You begin to have children. You begin to have grandchildren. You begin to have coworkers. You have, and all of a sudden you can't live your life just making decisions based on yourself. You make decisions based on what will benefit others as well. And, and this is a sign or an indicator that you are maturing or growing up. If you're living as a Christian... And the only thing you're asking is, can I or can't I? That's what, that's what the old saints used to call getting as close to the world as possible. Right? And, and, and my, I don't know what to teach you. I'm just going to tell you. I'm going to be honest. Maybe this is my failure. But if that's your heart's desire, I don't know that I have a word for you. If, if, you're, if your objective is, how close can I live to the world? How close can I engage in sin and still make it into heaven? I don't know what to tell you. Good luck. Let's see how it works out in the end. That's not who Paul's speaking to. Paul's speaking to people who love Jesus, who love the word of God, who want to literally want to serve him. Like they want to. They want to lift their hands in praise. They, they want to pray. They want to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to the Lord. They want to encourage people around them. They want to see the people around them not go to hell, but see the people around them join them in heaven for eternity. Amen. That's who Paul's speaking to. He says, if that's you, then, then, then this is how you live. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price, and your body and your lifestyle and the way you live is supposed to bring glory to God. And, and then he touches on, on the taboo topic of sex and sexuality, sexual immorality. God help us in America. God help us in America. Sexual immorality, he addresses it and he says this, in essence, this is the reality, the teaching of scripture. Sexual intercourse is far more than just a physical experience. If you're 30 and under, listen to me. It is more than just a hookup. You've been told it's just a hookup. It's no big deal. As long as both parties agree, it's fine. I'm telling you from God's word, God does not think it's fine. It is sexual immoral. It is sexually immoral. It is sin. According to the word of God. And the reason it's sin is he tells us in this very brief passage of scripture. He says when two people engage in sexual intercourse, it's more than just physical. It is the giving of yourself. It's giving of the essence of who you are. When, when you engage in sexuality, you are, you are giving of yourself to the other person. And according to the Bible, when that happens, the two become one. That's why the issue that they were having in Corinth, by the way, when we think things are terrible in America, they are. But the church at Corinth, this is what they were doing because they were unlearned. They didn't know. Christians were, have, were going to, to temples of Baal, temples of, of pagan uh, churches, and those places would have temple prostitutes. And Christian men were having sexual intercourse with, with pagan prostitutes as a, as a religious ritual. And Paul's like, wait a minute. He goes, you and Christ are one. 
You and Jesus, you, Jesus came in. Remember, your body is the temple of Christ. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. So when you go and engage in sexual intercourse with a harlot, you are bringing Jesus with you. We used to teach that. When I was a kid, that scared me to death. Why we quit teaching that? It's right here. Paul's telling them, listen to me. When you're hooking up with whoever you're hooking up with, you're G. If you're, you're bringing Jesus with you, you're going to tell me that that's morally acceptable? That that's okay? It's not okay. It is sin. That's what he's saying very clearly. It is sin. Not only is it a sin against the other individual, it's a sin against yourself. And, and folks, look, just look at what, I mean, do we really need to be convinced today that sexual sin is important? Look at what's going on in our society. I, I know, I don't want to get too, I don't want to get too, we, we had an outbreak of a sexually transmitted disease that they wouldn't even call a sexually transmitted disease recently. Monkeypox. Come on, if you did any research, you know that monkeypox was primarily transferred among homosexual partners. Nobody told you that. That's the reality. That's been happening now for years, we, 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 have, we, we, have, we have now such a perverse concept of sexuality, I don't have to tell you what's going on. You see it, right? And so all the while, God knew the heart of man. He knew that without parameters, without boundaries, that we would, that we would plunge into areas that we're walking in right now as a society, right? That will only cause harm and brokenness and darkness. And so he gave us this, this, this is what he did. He gave us this, this boundary, this, this, he created what we call marriage. It's between one man and one woman. And in that, in that covenant commitment, where I commit myself to this woman and she commits herself to me, we commit ourselves exclusively to one another. And in that in that, in that safety, in those parameters, we can have sexual intercourse. God's not against sex. He created it. But he knows that if it's not controlled, right, it will lead, it's like a fire that just blows out of control. Don't tell me it's not out of control. It's evident. And so sexual intercourse is to take place between one man and one woman within the covenant of marriage. Why would you be giving the essence of yourself to someone who's not willing to commit themselves to you? Well, I, I, can, I get more money from the government if I don't get married. Listen, that's not a reason to not commit and follow God's way. God will take care of you. I, God will take care of you. Think, 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 of, think of the reasons. Well, what if we get a divorce? Well, <laughs> you're sinning now. You're, you're in sin now. Like, like listen, think of, think of I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting sweaty. I'm 45 years old. I'm sweating and nervous preaching fundamental truths in Scripture. Tell me, man, who's not coming back next week? All the young people are going to be so mad at me. They're going to be so upset. They weren't taught this. You know what? At this point in this stage, I'm here to tell you truth. You have to know truth. You have to know what the word of God says. Right? Because we want to go, remember, the whole purpose is not to condemn. The purpose is to go from moth to butterfly. Amen. Quit living like a moth. Come on, somebody, say amen. Okay. So in order to follow Jesus, there has to be a full commitment. That's the reality. Jesus himself gave us an example. He took on himself a body, and he used that body to accomplish the will of God on earth. Think about that. He didn't have to. He's God. He could have done, he could have took on whatever, he could have took on the form of a butterfly and changed the world. He took on the form of a human body. And, and, and he showed us what it was to control that sin nature. He showed us what it was to control the flesh and to allow 
to, to allow yourself to be fully consecrated to God, right, at the highest level. And so now we're called to do the same. Romans chapter 6. Go there quickly, please. Romans chapter 6. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Let's read it. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You see, there's a question mark. So this is, it's a rhetorical question. Paul knows the answer to the question, and he expects that you know the answer to the question as well, right? But in case you don't, he's going to answer it very distinctly, very clearly. He's speaking to Christians who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And he says, should we, can we go back to one, please, sorry. Should we continue in sin and expect God's grace to remain with us? Next verse. God's word. Not Doug's word, not Pastor Doug. Not doctrine, not, not some church doctrine, not straight from the word of God. Inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul the Apostle. Certainly not. Don't be deceived. How shall we who died to sin live any longer to it. See, that's the issue. Because Paul's going, wait a minute. If, if you're going to do what I'm going to tell you in Romans 12, and you're going to commit yourself fully to Christ, soul, mind, body, spirit, then, then this question shouldn't even be asked. The question that we were talking about earlier, how, how close to sin can I get? How much sin can I engage in and still go to heaven? How, how much sin can I be a part of and still be a follower of Jesus? He's saying, no, wait a minute. If you died and you died to sin, then, then, then this shouldn't even be a question. Verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man, that is the old nature, that is sin nature, was crucified with Jesus, with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Let me stop there. We're going to keep reading in a minute, but I want to make sure you, you ingest all of this. Now, all of a sudden, I know how minds work. What's he preaching? You know, Christians don't ever sin. No, Paul is taking very clearly that you and I are no longer bound by the power of sin. That means, that means we don't, we, we're not just bound to do whatever our flesh desires. We have the freedom in Christ to make wise decisions when faced with temptation. We have the power. We have the choice, right? We are, we are dead to the old nature and we are alive to a new nature which gives us the freedom. Do we sin? Sure. There are times that we sin. But our lives are not marked by the dominance of sin. Somebody say amen. amen. And if you look at your life and it's just constant sin, like you're, you can't stop, just so sin, there's an issue. That's what Paul's teaching. <clears throat> verse 7. For he who is... No, no, wait. Verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Here we are, verse 11. Likewise. So notice he's using an analogy of Christ's literal death and resurrection. And, he's, and he's, the analogy is that's what takes place with you spiritually. Okay, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign as king. Remember, you're going to serve one or the other. 
Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in its lust. Do not present your members, that means your body, right? Your eyes, your hands, your brain, your thoughts. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. You should be waking up every day saying, God, how can you use my hands for good? Get them off of all the foolishness that's coming out of your phone and lift them up to God and worship and say, where, how can you use these effectively for once? Instead of watching things with your eyes over and over that depress you and discourage you and harm you and bring darkness into your soul and you're watching evil, demonic things come in through the eye gate that, that, that is your instrument that is supposed to be sold to Christ, start watching things that are lovely and pure. Get in nature. Look at the things of God. Come on, somebody. Help me out. Say Amen. Use your feet, use your mind and your thoughts, present them all to God for the glory of his name. Quit using them or surrendering them to sin. He makes it very clear. For sin, verse 14, last verse, shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law, you're under grace. For those of you this morning say, man, it's just so hard. Paul knows that. God knows that. That's why he gives you what is called grace. You're not going to get to heaven and give an account for a life lived in sin and say, it was just too hard. Because the response, I believe, is going to direct response is, but you had my grace, and my grace was sufficient. In other words, you've been equipped to make a change. You've been equipped to do what I've commanded you to do in my word. I didn't just command you to do it. I also gave you the ability and the power to do it. Does that make sense? And that's what, that's, that's what we'll be given an account for. And so we're called today to not yield our bodies to sinful things, but to yield our body to things of righteousness. All right, back to Romans 12. Oh, wow, I got to go. This is why we're, I'm, I'm not going to go too long. I don't want to give too, okay, second word. The second word is present. And it means present once and for all, and it speaks of determination and commitment. Jesus made it very clear that we cannot be his followers unless we deny ourselves. Jesus said that himself. That is not my opinion. Jesus said, unless a man deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, he cannot be my follower. That's what Jesus said. What does deny self mean? It means you've sold yourself to Jesus. You, you can't, you're not your own any longer. Paul said it, right? Is it being clear in Scripture? It is. It's very clear, isn't it? There is no such thing this morning as a casual or carnal Christian. There is no such thing as a divided Christian. You're either dead in sin or you're dead to sin. I'll, I'll leave it with this. The church used to sing an old song, and it went like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, I still will follow. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. That's what the word present means. I'm, I'm, I'm determined. I'm, I might fall. I might stray. I'll have seasons of, of weakness and struggle but I'm not turning back. I'm not turning back. There's nothing to go back to. My eyes are on Jesus. When I sin, he's my advocate. When, when I sin and fall, he's the one that I call to and he's faithful and just to forgive me. He is my merciful savior. And so, so even when I do fail, even when I do fail in my best efforts and, and I fall in, in moments when I think I'm strong, in those moments, I will look to Christ and he will cleanse me and forgive me, but I'm not turning back. I am determined. I am presenting my body as a living sacrifice once and for all. How many are with me this morning? Just say amen to that. All right, let's go. Let's go really quick. 
Do not be conformed to this world. The word conformed means to pattern or style or style after. To be similar, to be similar to or identical, it means to be in agreement. And so you and I can conform to this world when we begin to agree with it, when we begin to walk in its ways, when we begin to line our perspectives with worldly thought. It's, it's when you and I, without realizing it, are squeezed in its mold and we come out acting and thinking and talking and doing the same, th- same things that it does. And, and so this morning, you have to know what the, word, what the word world means. Some of you in this room, you don't even know. The word world is a broad term, and it refers to the godless system that is influenced by the God of this age, the prince and power of the air. It is the philosophies and perspectives that are contrary to the kingdom of God. So let's pause and make this very simple. What does it mean to not conform to the world? It means do not do something simply because it's socially acceptable. God help us in this current climate. Because anything's socially acceptable now. It, it, means, it means my decisions are not based on what's socially acceptable. My decisions are based on what God's word te- teaches. It, it, means, it means do not take on ungodly philosophies of things like marriage or church or relationships or politics or finances. Instead, seek God's direction in those issues. Align yourself with what God says, knowing that he is the final authority. You see, there, years ago, we would have taught this and said, don't let the world be an influence over you, right? Don't, don't let the world kind of, kind of influence. And, and what we were speaking about was a world that was tolerant to sinful behavior, Behavior that was contrary to the law and heart and nature of Christ, right? And that, that was kind of the world. And that's still true. But today, folks, there is a shift, I think, that's happened where now the world is not just saying, well, this behavior is okay, it's tolerable, we'll allow it in our ranks as a society. Now, it's, we're being, now the, the, the world system is pushing you to do it. If you don't believe that, just, just recent studies that are coming out now, that there is a huge uptick in young ladies doing what is called transitioning. Transitioning from saying that they're no longer a, a young lady and saying that they're a, a boy. And the numbers are staggering. And, and it's starting to catch the attention of secular, not biblical, not Bible thumpers like me, not old Bible thumpers, you know, those old hillbilly Bible thumpers. They don't know what they're talking about. No, no. The scientists now, the secular, the people that are smart, are saying, wait a minute, this is, something's wrong. This is not, this is a, it's called an, it's called a, uh, uh, when, it, when it's out of, uh, it's out of, it's an abnormality, okay? The numbers are not adding up. There's a huge uptick in young ladies saying that they were designed, that they were made by God to actually be another gender. And he said, this isn't right. This doesn't fit all of our statistical data. So in their perspective, they'd say, there will always be a certain number of people who will be homosexual or who will be uh, transgender, right? That's what they believe. And, and because of that, the society said, if you want to be gay, be gay. If, if you want to be transgender, be transgender. But now they're saying, hang on a minute. There's this huge spike, and this is what they're saying. Because of social media... And because of the way society's gone, they're saying, we believe this is a social construct. In other words, what they're saying is, there's now pressure from society that transitioning is something cool and acceptable and that you should actually try it. And so now, what I'm, the only reason I'm bringing that up is because, because society, the world system now isn't just saying, yeah, we'll tolerate that. Yeah, we'll allow that, right? We've watched that happen for years. Some of you that's been in this room, you've watched those borders be pushed and pushed and pushed. We'll allow that. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Now, that's not what's happening in our worldly system today. Now the world is saying, no, you should do this. They're telling your children. You should transition. You should try homosexual sex. You, sh- you, sh- you should engage in this behavior. You should watch pornography. Are you, you understand? And, and so it's not now where it's just a passive ideology that says, hey, we, we're, if, 
que sera, sera. Be what you want, do what you want, we'll just leave our hands up. Now, no, no, no. Now they're saying, you should do this. You, you should, and there's a pressure, and there's a push. And, and God knew it. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he said, make sure you don't get squeezed into that mold. Make sure you protect your children. Make sure you're protecting the people around you. Do not let the worldly philosophies squeeze you into its mold. Now listen, I got, I'm going to close with this. Because everyone in the room amens me on that one. So let's do a few that you won't amen me on. What about the idea and the philosophies of marriage? The church, the conservative Christian movement, angry, teeth out when it comes to homosexual marriage. That's contrary to the word of God. It wasn't Adam and Eve. It's Adam and Steve. It's I was... But wink an eye when your heterosexual children are living in sexual sin outside of marriage. Mm. I got I to tiptoe. Come on, somebody. What's God saying? Oh, I see what it is. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna handpick what they want to believe. They're going to handpick what they want to follow. No. The definition of marriage from the heart of God that cannot be shifted or changed is one man, one woman in holy matrimony. Not, not living together for years to see if it's going to work out. Take a chance. Amen. We the rest of us did. I threw a gamble. And Charlotte won the lottery. I mean, I won won the lottery. No, no, listen, come on. I want to be careful because I don't want you to think that it's just, it's real talk, right? It's It's an issue that the church within our walls have to deal with. Correct? Would you agree? We, we've got to deal with like, like how we really stand on marriage. I'm not saying that we point fingers at those and we never. No one's suggesting that we, that, but, but when you're asked and like you, your expectation and what does God say, like you just point people to the word of God. I, I had someone recently come to me and I said, this is what God's word says. And, and I wasn't, I'm not, I'm not like angry at that person. I don't look down on that person. I don't look down on you this morning if you're living with someone else. I don't think you're, you're a sinner. You're a terrible person. Oh, I can't believe you. I think we got to get rid of that stigma as well. That's called judging. But we've got to be honest with the word of God. Otherwise, it's just, we're, just, we're conforming to the world. Would you agree? We're just doing no different than the world does, and we're just backpedaling. What about What about church? What about the concept and the idea of church where now in many churches there's no prayer There's no dissecting of the word of God. There's secular music that's used for worship in the house of God. I mean, folks, these are terrible things. Relationships. How about politics? How about finances? Right? So all of a sudden you begin to realize there's there's plenty of area for all of us. That's why we're not pointing fingers. Remember Jesus said, don't try to get... Don't try to get that speck out of someone else's eye. Get the log out of your own first. So that's what we do individually. But as a church, the, the, the word of God rules and reigns. So if you come for counsel, if you want to know the truth, the truth is God's word. It's not God's will for you to live in sin. Does that make sense? Is that safe? Is that, is that, is that sound healthy and right from God's word? If you agree, say amen. amen. Come on, give him praise. Let's stand all over the building. We're just going to stop there. I don't want to give too much, and I'm serious. I, got, I could go for another half hour. But we're not, because I want to dissect this. I want this to settle in your spirit. I want you to hear what God's saying. Don't you think it's just some preacher ranting and raving again? Oh, here we go. I, guys, we got we to gotta honor the word of God. We are bound by the word of God. We're bound by God's word. It is the only moral authority that we have to stand on. And in the world now where, gosh, every moral compass, every institution that we thought was moral and is crumbling around us, 
Would you agree that the people of God have to cling to the word of God? As they get ready to sing, I want to say, if you're here, and maybe something that we read or something that was said impacts you, I pray that it did cut you. I pray that it did convict you. Because the reason I say that is not that you would be harmed, but because I know this, when I'm cut, I go to Jesus. I'm suggesting to you that's exactly what you should do this morning. If you've been cut by God's word, go to Jesus. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him for help. Set out on a journey that with his grace and his strength, you're going to make a change. You're going to repent. And watch what the Lord does. He'll be, he's right there every day. Is he faithful and just to forgive our sins? Every time. Every time. Would you bow your head with me for just a second? Close your eyes. If you're here this morning and you're away from Jesus, something from God's word has pierced your heart, and you're like, man, I got to get right with the Lord. You want to do that this morning. We want to give you first opportunity. Eyes are closed. Heads are bowed. If you're here and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, will you raise your hand? Let us pray with you today. Anyone in the building, balcony, on the floor, and you say, today, I want to give my life. I want to do what the scripture says. I want to give all that I am to Jesus Christ. Raise your hand if that's you. For the rest of us this morning, I'm sure there was something in this. If nothing else for me as I'm studying this week, I'm going, we can teach this and I can teach it because you're putting it in my heart. But I can't give the people the will to live it. You're going to have to do that. I can't give you the will to live what the word of God says. But I trust this morning that the Holy Spirit will. He'll give you the desire. He'll give you the, the, the passion, the will. And so why don't we lift our hand, let them just sing a verse all over this church. Just one verse and together with our hands lifted, let's ask for that God, I want to get closer to you and further from the world. Maybe that's just your, that's just your prayer. Maybe some of you have gotten caught in the, in the mold a little bit of the world, and you just need to begin to make some changes, begin to ask him for the help. Come on, all over the building. Sing a verse. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you did, make sure you like and share on social media to help spread God's word. If you'd like to learn more about The Bridge, or if you'd like to give, you can go to our website at thebridge129.org. Again, thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.